coming up on Stu Does America. Gavin Newsom sucks. You know it. I know it. California knows it. And he's been extra sucky for the past year or so during the pandemic. We'll get the scoop from Mediate's John Ziegler on how the troubled governor went from being on women's underwear to having a massive recall effort against him. Uh, and cancel culture rages on, perhaps claiming new victims you haven't even heard about. We'll look into the massive dent to television our oversensitive liberal friends have made. Have you done your part in the war against the evil YouTube algorithm robots yet today? If not, help us out by subscribing to our YouTube and podcast channels and liking all of our episodes. Find links to watch wherever you can, stewdoesamerica.com, or become a true member of the team with a subscription to Blaze TV. Just go to blazetv.com slash stew, enter the promo code stew, because that's how they know you like this stupid show and you'll save 10 bucks. After roughly a year of pandemic insanity, it is time to rank our states on how they responded to the virus overall. So let's do the State COVID Awards. Stu does America. You know, we here at Stu does America, if nothing else, are lawful citizens. So let me start with the line that every conservative in America is legally required to say today. Welcome to the one year anniversary of 15 days to slow the spread. Here is the moment we all learned about that wonderful phrase. Ah, there it is. Donald Trump, our now former president, of course, holding up the wonderful sign that says 15 days to slow the spread. Obviously, that 15 days ended and then it was extended through April as a set of national guidelines. And that's the period that I really consider to be the actual full lockdown. After that, states started separating in the way they were handling the virus. Some continued lockdown. Uh, I, but, you know, here I am in Texas. I was at an indoor restaurant on May 1st, 2020. So uh, there's been two worlds, two, two Americas going on here uh, over the past year. So I wanted to look back at all of the different approaches and outcomes that were attempted and see which states did the best and which states did the worst. Now, there are plenty of ways to do that, but I decided to kind of dig into the data and attempt to come up with a comprehensive ranking that took into account as much of the picture as possible. For example, how did the state do against the actual virus? How did they do in maintaining the economy as best as possible? We adjusted for the age of the population and population density, among other things, and even looked at the efficiency of the vaccine rollout. Finally, we looked at the government restrictions implemented in each state by utilizing the University of Oxford stringency index. We all realize, you know, we were kind of once, uh, you know, in this place where everything looked really dark. And eventually we got to the middle of a once in a lifetime situation. And most of us sort of put up Uh, with a little bit more than we normally would. It was a strange year. But you have to remember this is America. You need to preserve as much freedom as humanly possible and keeping those restrictions active for as little time as you can. For example, if two states held the same performance in all the other categories, but one achieved that with draconian lockdowns and the other had no restrictions at all, the tiebreaker should go to the state that offered more freedom. That's not to say a state that can't, you know, that you know, sort of went full lockdown. Uh, they could still do well on this. Uh, they can, and some did. But we can't only be looking at keeping people alive as if it's the only thing to think about. If we wanted that, a state that kept us all in individual plastic bubbles would win every single time. What we're looking for is the sort of fusion approach, the best comprehensive thing that we can look at, not just from the government, but also from the people of the state. Then, of course, we plugged it into a fancy formula and gave each state a score, 1 to 100. So let's see the results. We start with the worst five states in the union. You guys suck. Coming in at number five, uh, well, at least fifth from the bottom, with a total score of 27.8 out of 100. Congratulations to the state that I grew up in, Connecticut. Yeah, no hometown advantage here. That's not what we do. Just the facts, ladies and gentlemen, just inching out Massachusetts to get into our worst five. Connecticut ranked 45th in covid deaths per million. Not in a good way, like the bad way, despite they had uh, the third most stringent lockdown in the country. Great job, everybody. The economy did okay, kind of in comparison to some of these lockdown states. But overall, it was pretty much a disaster. Hopefully. As a former resident, they will still allow me back in after this ranking. But you know what? 
No rush, Connecticut. I love you, but no rush there. Moving on to the fourth worst COVID response. It's a tiny state. It sounds like it's surrounded by water, but instead it's surrounded by annoying accents. With a score of 25.2 out of 100, it's Rhode Island. Rhode Island, of course, did not perform well in any category. It was third from the bottom in COVID deaths, despite a severe lockdown, and the economy suffered a very harsh fate as well. While being an island helped out a lot of countries and helped them shield themselves from the virus, being Rhode Island didn't seem to help at all. Now we're up to the third worst COVID response in America. Aren't you getting nervous? We're getting so close to the worst. You should be if you happen to live in the next state. With a pathetic score of only 20.6 out of 100, the opposite of congratulations goes to the state of Louisiana. There you go, Louisiana, congratulations. Now let no one claim that we're only hammering blue states here, as Louisiana's Republican voting record could not shield it from a terrible performance against the coronavirus. Louisiana had a terrible outbreak at the beginning, putting it in 43rd place in raw health measures. And also the government took drastic measures to try to lock it down. And the economy was brutalized as well. Now, some astute observers might say part of the problem was going ahead with Mardi Gras in late February. One study says a single individual may have kicked off a chain of transmission during the holiday, eventually leading to 50,000 infections in Louisiana. And that decision and that event were held in very blue New Orleans, not very red Louisiana. Fair enough, but as long as New Orleans is still in your state, you have to answer for it. Sorry, Louisiana. Now we are all the way down to the second worst COVID response in America. I am all a tingle. Remember, Louisiana had a score of 20. We have a massive drop off to our next state. With a score of only 7.9, it's New Mexico. A lot of people forget about New Mexico in the middle of this. New Mexico actually had the harshest lockdown for the longest amount of time in America. You've heard a lot about other states. New Mexico had the harshest lockdown. New Mexico has a population that is pretty spread out and pretty young but it still had an outbreak that was close to the worst in the entire United States. Really, the only thing New Mexico did pretty well was get the vaccine out the door, but honestly, that's not enough to keep them out of our second worst slot. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. What state was the most mismanaged? The state that failed in every category. Which state almost seemed like it had a romantic relationship with COVID-19? This state had more people die from COVID than any other state in the union. All of this, despite having the second most strict lockdown period in the entire country. How does that work? It had an economy that ranked in the bottom seven, and that was the bright spot in their performance. Some would say that the possibility that the governor was spending most of his time groping passing teenagers may have contributed to the problems of this state. But I disagree with that analysis. The more attention he paid to the state, the worse things would get. The absolute worst COVID performance in America and really throughout the world comes from the absolute worst governor in America and really throughout the world with a pathetically feeble score of 6.8 out of 100. It is, you know it well, New York. It's worth mentioning that, of course, most of the states near the bottom of this list are neighbors of New York and only had these issues because of spillover from New York. So basically, the whole bottom of the list is New York's fault and therefore Andrew Cuomo's fault. Now, this might be a great time to mention that Andrew Cuomo is awful. Dot com. We have the five best states for COVID performance. Some surprises on the list coming up next. I mean, you, you knew it had to be New York, right? Trying to buy or sell a home in these times can be challenging. And that's why you need a real estate agent who's going to come in and take charge. And I will say, if you're fleeing New York, if you're fleeing California, if you're fleeing these blue states and moving to a red state, you might not have a lot of knowledge of that area you're going to. You might want to find the best real estate agent in that new place. How do you find that? Realestateagentsitrust.com. Glenn, uh, is, you know, if you're in radio... 
you know this. If you know anyone in radio, you know this. You move around like every 10 minutes. You get fired from like every a job every two weeks. And Glenn, this happened to Glenn. He moved all around the country, sometimes good moves, sometimes bad moves. But he never had a real estate agent in the new place he was going. Now he always can. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go. Get more information at realestateagentsitrust.com. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. All right, we gave you the five worst states throughout the pandemic. So what about the five best? I will say there were some surprises for me on this list, and this one's a big one. I just barely inching out Iowa and somehow coming in fifth place overall with a score of 70.1 out of 100 is Oregon. I, it's honestly hard for me to square this one to reality, but I'm only telling you what the numbers say. Don't blame me. Blame the spreadsheet. How did Oregon do so well? Well, first, the economy held up reasonably well, which probably indicates a high percentage of population uh, who was able to work at home. While Oregon had some government policies I certainly would not like, they were basically in the middle of the pack when it came to restrictions. But they also were in the top five best outcomes from COVID. Part of this might have been because Portland was on fire the entire time and no one wanted to go outside. But as I said, we take everything into account. So Oregon finishes somehow in fifth place. Now, as we move on to fourth, it's a state so cold that possible COVID maybe, I don't know, maybe they just didn't want to go. Maybe the little uh, those little creepy uh, pointy things didn't want to travel there because it was too cold. I don't know. It's not a densely populated state and it has a younger population, both of which heard it in our rankings. But that didn't stop from getting all the way up to number four with a score of 74.1 out of 100. Congratulations to Idaho. Ah, yes, Idaho did everything well across the board. They were in the top third as far as economic performance, in the top third of states resisting the disease, and in the top third as far as freedom. They didn't crack down too harshly on the population and still kept the economy chugging anyway. And, of course, in contrast to, let's say, the Dakotas, for example, never were really hit with a terrible outbreak of the virus. Idaho finishes in fourth place. Now, on to third. It's the most purple of purple states with razor thin election margins in both of the last two presidential races. With a score of 83.9 out of 100, it's Wisconsin. Hmm. Now there's a little bit of an asterisk here to this one and I'm just gonna be honest with you. Wisconsin was in the middle of the pack on the economy and did pretty well in avoiding the worst part of the virus. But the reason it's this high in our little rankings here It's because mainly it was in the top five when it comes to freedom from restrictions, according to the Oxford University measure. Hmm, I don't know how I feel about that. It's a surprise to me. It's a surprise to most, considering Wisconsin has a Democratic governor who really tried to clamp down many times. This one, however, you can give credit to the courts. While the governor tried to put in a bunch of really draconian restrictions, the courts kept overturning them. So while Wisconsin ended up with a very strange on again, off again vibe, which probably was really annoying to deal with as a citizen, but it did help a lot in our stupid ranking. So Wisconsin at number three. At number two, we have another traditional purple state with a score of 84.9 out of 100. It's New Hampshire. Hmm, New Hampshire has the second most libertarians in the United States and the second highest overall freedom uh, ranking of any of the states by the Cato Institute. The economy was in the middle of the pack as far as COVID impact, but had a relatively light impact from the virus itself and kept the restrictions largely off the citizens uh, after an early lockdown period. Live free or die worked out relatively well for New Hampshire coming in at number two. And finally, all the way up at number one. This state has the sixth best COVID numbers in the country. They have the seventh best economic numbers in the country, all while maintaining the third shortest amount of time in lockdown of any other state. With a score of 90.1 out of 100 at the top of the heap with the best overall response to the pandemic, it is Utah. Congratulations to Utah. Wow. What an accomplishment. What exactly did Utah do better than anyone else? Was it some amazing government policy? No. They came up with a unique idea, though. An amazing idea to fill the state with tons and tons of Mormons. 
I mean, this part is a little bit of speculation, but let me at least give you the theory here. I think this is it. Over and over again, throughout this entire year, we've talked on this show about how the media is always blabbing on about what governments should do during the COVID-19 era. And over and over again, we've seen that this doesn't really matter all that much. In literally every single state in the union, people started staying at home before their governments announced a stay-at-home order. And the same thing happened in reverse later on. People kept popping their heads out of lockdown and venturing out before their government said it was okay to do so. I've said it before, and I will say it again. This is freaking America. In America, the people lead the government, not the other way around. I have worked with approximately 74% of the entire Mormon population in the United States here at The Blaze. That's just a guesstimate. But compared to the rest of humanity, Mormons tend to be healthier, more likely to follow rules without being forced to, and more likely to think about others rather than themselves. This is the exact population you would want to design in a lab if you were hoping to successfully deal with a pandemic. Utah is also the youngest state in the union, but even when we heavily weight the formula against them for this reason, they still wind up with the number one ranking on our list of states. Surprised me. I wouldn't have said I wouldn't have guessed Utah, frankly. But congratulations, Utah. Now go out and celebrate with an ice cold, frosty root beer. Research found that the average EMS response in in, uh, the United States is 37 minutes. So think about that. You're in an emergency. Someone like slices some terrible artery open. And you're just like, ah, eh, 37 minutes should be about, uh, you'll be okay in 37 minutes, right, honey? Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. Uh, You are the first responder. First responders are fantastic. We love them. But really, you're the first responder. You're the one on site that needs to do something in an emergency. Every American should have a bare first aid kit from Refuge Medical. The bare first aid kit is guaranteed for life. It exceeds military specification for individual first aid kits. And it's also used by military personnel in 14 countries. If you have uh, a kid, ooh, uh, I have kids that go out and they play, and every time they go outside, usually someone comes back in crying because there's been a fall, there's been a cut, there's been a scraped knee. Usually it's not that bad, but I'm always waiting for that really terrible one. When it comes to that time, you, you don't want to be, ah, I should have got that first aid kit. Don't let that happen to you. RefugeMedical.com. Get 15% off all of their first aid kits with the promo code STU. Be sure to use that promo code STU because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Plus, you'll get that 15% off. If we've learned one lesson this year, it's to be prepared for anything. RefugeMedical.com. RefugeMedical.com. Promo code is STU. Joining me once again is senior columnist for Mediaite, John Ziegler. His latest piece is a great one. A year ago, Gavin Newsom changed the USA, and here is why he now rightly faces a recall election. John, thanks for coming back on the program. Stu, always good to talk to you. Yeah, your piece is interesting because I have to say I forgot that California was first. I, I I, I, you know, you, you say uh, in the piece, um, it's the most impactful state-based decision in modern American history. And I, th- I think you're right on target there. People do forget it's been a very long year. And I, I uh, as a sports guy, uh, Stu, you'll appreciate this. I think the two most underrated decisions in all of this were Gavin Newsom being the first governor to shut down a, a state and it being the largest and most influential liberal state of California. But also people really forget this one. You might not. The Ivy League Basketball Conference Mm. canceling its championship basketball tournament in Philadelphia. That was the moment when I went, oh, my gosh, we've left the the pull of the rational earth, the gravitational pull of the rational earth. And as we now know, a year later, that was a colossal mistake because there's no reason to stop playing basketball. And the Ivy League has proven itself to be completely out of touch throughout all this, canceling all their sports for a year, while everybody else has still continued to play without incident, at least from a major health perspective. So uh, Newsom's decision was politically incredibly important. You know very well, Stu, uh, how political cover works and how momentum and domino effects 
take over. And that's what happened here. Because California is so large and because it's liberal, and it, it, it basically forced every other Democratic governor in the country to do exactly the same. And then once that happens in a panic, it's a, a, a cascading effect. It's an avalanche. All the weak Republican governors immediately have to follow suit because the media is against them. They have no political cover. If I'm not, if the, if the state bordering mine is doing it, I have to do the same thing. And that left really basically only a couple of states left. And once everyone starts doing it, they become invested in the effectiveness of it. And let's be very clear about what was the basis of Gavin Newsom's decision. And this is the heart of my column. And this is part, something that no one ever remembers because the media has forgotten about it. It was based on a complete, total, bald-faced lie. Mm. He told Californians that 25 and a half million of us out of 40 million would get the virus in eight weeks. In eight weeks. Eight weeks later, there were less than 100,000 confirmed cases. And it wasn't because we shut down. It was because the threat was not as it had been portrayed. If, uh, if you were a doctor, you had a doctor, Stu, who said to you without notice, um, look, uh, Stu, uh, I hate to tell you this, but um, we need to remove your testicles, uh, both of them, uh, <laughs> because you're probably going to die tomorrow if we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, don't worry. We'll probably give them back to you in a few weeks after this is all done. Uh, it, and then it turned out that that surgery was not necessary and he never gave, gave you your balls back a year <laughs> later. How pissed would you be? Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's Did this happen to Gavin Newsom. Is this actually a real story about Gavin Newsom? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm creating a, an analogy. Yes. OK. The, got it. the analogy of, of Dr. Newsom or <laughs> Governor Pusum, as my young daughters refer to him, uh, what he did to us a year ago. And he still hasn't given us our balls back. And the surgery wasn't necessary. It did nothing to further the health of the state. It only destroyed the economy and probably created far greater health collateral damage, as we've seen from the juxtaposition of the data in Florida and the data in California, where there's almost no difference. And in the winter time, the most recent spike, most recent wave, uh, California's done much worse than Florida. Yeah, you know, this is really, you brought, I, I do remember Gavin Newsom doing this and making this promise. And even at the time, it seemed, even with New York in the worst of its uh, state, it still seemed crazy. These, these projections he was saying, eight weeks, two thirds of the state. I mean, I, that's just not something. I mean, if it's that bad, you're just going to get to herd immunity in like uh, you know, a couple of months and it's going to be over. There's not much you can do about it, right? There's no well, time to develop well, a vaccine or a treatment. To, to be clear, I wrote about it the next day. Mm. And, uh, you know, one of the, the many lessons of the last year is there's no risk. The reason why people don't go against these predictions is that there's no risk reward in doing so. I basically risk my reputation and my job at Mediate to say this is crazy. These projections don't make any sense statistically. They're not going to happen. I couldn't have been more right. It did me no good whatsoever. <laughs> no. This is your life, John. That's this is whole, your life. That's, that's the world we now live in. I mean, mm. it, you are far better off if you make a false predict, prediction of doom than you are if you make an accurate prediction that the prediction of doom is false. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a crazy world we're living in, and that's part of why what has happened over the last year has been allowed to manifest itself. You know, th it's, it's one thing if you're like a global warming person and you're, you're, you're saying there's going to be an imminent doom. At least you're saying it's 10 years off and people will forget about it. I mean, eight weeks, this was proven wrong almost immediately, and there's no state in the union that has anywhere near that percentage of positive cases at this point. It never got to that level. And uh, and that was the justification. It was not only the justification for the shutdown. It was also a justification for pulling all, all the kids out of school. It's a justification for keep continuing this lockdown for as long as it's gone. And, you know, there is a real argument to be made here that this is the single crazy... I, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a Cuomo absolutist here on, on this stuff when it comes to complete mismanagement of COVID. But Gavin Newsom deserves a place up on that uh, on that mantle somewhere. I think he's at least as bad, uh, if not worse. I mean, some of the things that uh, he did here in California were, were just bat crap crazy. Uh, the uh, an anti science uh, spending millions of dollars in resources to shut down beaches. 
uh, during the mm. summertime when there were no cases. And we now know the beach is probably the safest place you could possibly be in this kind of a situation. I mean, that's just one of many examples. Uh, schools are much slower to open here in California than anywhere else because uh, he is completely beholden to the teachers unions. Then, of course, there's the restaurant situation where he got caught. How about this arrogance and hypocrisy getting caught uh, dining indoors at a fancy fresh French restaurant with uh, medical lobbyists with no masks. I mean, and by the way, the key part of that whole controversy was not that he was he was hypocritical. It proved that he himself knew these restrictions were ridiculous and unneeded. That's to me is always the key mm. part of this that people miss. It's not just the hypocrisy. They know these things don't work. This is all about power. It's about politics. Politics and it's about being invested in an original fairy tale narrative, a narrative we now know to be a fairy tale because we have a year's worth of data to look at and we have places like Florida to compare it to. We now know this was a colossal mistake. I'm not saying that nothing should have happened. This was a horrible set of circumstances, but this was a cer situation where we had very little control in the long run over what was going to happen. And what we were told was going to happen never did, not just w nowhere in the United States, Nowhere in the world, Stu, mm -hmm. has anything happened anything close to what Governor Newsom predicted when he effectively told the state of California, uh, I'm your king and uh, good luck and uh, I'll give the power back when I'm forced to. And a year later, he still hasn't. So very true. Uh, so, John, it's easy for you know me to say bad, really bad things about Andrew Cuomo, you to say bad things about Gavin Newsom. We're conservatives. We're going to be critical of, of, of Democrats when they come and they do wrong things. Let me ask you a somewhat uncomfortable question, and I know you'll go wherever you have to go to find the truth. But like one person who I don't know, maybe needs closer eyes on his role in all of this is our former president, Donald Trump. I mean, we, we showed the picture here earlier today of Donald Trump. He's the guy who introduced the phrase to all of us, 15 days to stop the spread. You know, he, he yeah, people bash Fauci all the time, but like, you know, this guy employed Fauci. It was, you know, it was Donald Trump who made these announcements of all these lockdowns. How much of a role and how much blame does Donald Trump uh, deserve in, in the same role you take, you said with Gavin Newsom, where when he comes out and he's for lockdowns, those red states are going to fall right in line with a, with a Republican president. Stu, uh, thank you for asking that question, because I, I wish more conservatives like us would explore this, because it's an important part of the equation and understanding what really transpired here. I believe that the biggest mistake of the Trump presidency, and it may have cost him a, a second term, is that he effectively did not trust his own instincts. And I'm uh, someone who is anti-Trump in most ways. I agree with him on most issues, but I was anti-Trump from the beginning because I, I saw this backlash eventually coming. But he has pretty decent instincts. He has pretty good common sense. And after he initially downplayed it, I think his instincts were good, but he didn't trust them. And I think that he effectively choked. I think he choked. I think he got scared by Fauci and by others. And he effectively turned his presidency over to Dr. Fauci. And that was a critical mistake, not just for his own presidency, but for the country. Donald Trump created the Fauci monster that we still have to deal with today. And he deserves blame for that. And it's a, one of the more mystifying aspects of those who, who treat Donald Trump like a cult leader that they don't want to see that. They hate Fauci, but they still love Donald Trump. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very conflicted by all that as well. I don't see a lot. There's not a lot of reflection on that one, I don't feel like, on, on the right. Um, let, me, uh, let me go down one more road with you here. Like, this would be as uncomfortable as possible. Uh, we see a lot, too, uh, of the people who I think we would generally agree with on being anti-lockdown, who tend to seem to also be anti-vaccine. I am a guy, you know, I have a lot of friends who go down this road, and I love them to death, but I am, like, the most pro-vaccine person in America. I think it's a fantastic thing. I'm really impressed by the, by the developments. And again, this was, in large part, the Trump administration. Donald Trump got the vaccine himself, but a lot of people who are big Trump fans seem to be opposed to it and, and so, sort of seem to seemingly want to sink the effort generally. Do you, do you have a, a take on that? 
Yeah, I've struggled with the same issue and, and even taken on some of our fellow uh, team reality members like Alex Bernson, former New York Times reporter, who I agree with on 95 percent of this stuff. But I think he's gone too far down the anti-vaccine uh, trail. I, I think there are questions about the vaccines. I think this is an unprecedented situation and we need to keep a close eye on it. Sure. But I am very pro-vaccine as well. I think, uh, Stu, that the reason why there is this connection is uh, that you, you have a libertarian bent in both. They don't force me to take a, a, a vaccine. Don't uh, lock me down. Tell me I can't uh, go to a restaurant. I have to wear a mask. So I think that there is a, a connection there. There's also uh, a little bit of a conspiracy conspiracy element to it. Um, there's a lot of anti-Bill Gates uh, uh, mm -hmm. sentiment out there among uh, people who agree with us on the lockdowns. And I think that's driving part of this, this whole uh, reset, the great reset thing, which uh, the left has, has uh, embraced and I think has been used by some on the right as saying, wait a minute, this really is the end uh, of our way of life and that this is all going to be about uh, socialism and fascism. And by the way, uh, who can blame people like that based <laughs> upon what we've seen over the last year? Right, right. So I, I guess my answer to that is I disagree with those people, but I can understand why they're coming, where they're coming from, because we're in such a bizarre, unprecedented situation. And so many of the data points make a rational person go, whoa, what the heck is going on here? Mm. And so I, I, I don't want to be too critical of those people. I just I just say, can we can we hold off on on uh, being too doomsday ish on the vaccine? Uh, I mean, the, the data is exceedingly good in most areas of the world, especially here in the United States. And let's just hope that what we've been told is true. If it is true, this thing is almost over. If it's not, we're all screwed anyway. So, uh, you know, it, I'm not sure it's going to matter much. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to get myself to the same place there, John. Uh, John Ziegler, senior columnist at Media. Uh, be sure to read John's piece. Uh, it is a year ago. Gavin Newsom changed the USA. And here is why he rightly faces a recall election. And we'll have John on again because I know this, this recall is going to happen. They've got the signatures. So there's going to be a lot to watch here. John Ziegler, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks, too. All right. Back in a second. Sort of a light day on the Andrew Cuomo is awful dot com front. Uh, there is a new editorial from the Times Union, uh, which is the big paper in Albany, who is now calling for the resignation of Andrew Cuomo. Yet another voice in this seemingly en uh, endless parade of people calling for his resignation. Obviously, he's not going to listen to them right now. He's he's carved out this path where he's going to wait until we get this investigation done. If that investigation turns against him, though, I don't know what he's going to do. I mean, he might he's such a dolt. He may try to still push through it, but it's going to destroy any chances he has of being reelected. We'll kind of watch that as it goes. Another odd development. And by the way, this is all before this is all this editorial saying uh, he's got to resign before we called him the worst state in the union in our covid list earlier today. I and mean, that's going to be very damaging. I mean, imagine how many people are going to jump on board now. It's, it's really disturbing. Uh, by the way, on the covid front. Um, we have this odd story developing in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, the AstraZeneca vaccine has not approved here in the United States yet. It was approved very early on in Great Britain. They've been uh, vaccinating their population at a higher pace than even here in the United States. There's been this odd pushback from and it seems to be related to sort of an anti-Brexit sort of attitude. Um, there is a uh, there's a rumor going around that it is causing um, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine is causing some blood clots. Now, there's no evidence to support this. Um, even the people who are saying it are saying it's happening to one in 167,000 people. So the, that's what the people in Europe are saying. The people in uh, in Great Britain, where they've used it much more widely and have tested it on, a, you know, the, I mean, a quarter of their population at this point uh, has taken this vaccine at least. Uh, they are saying they're seeing blood clots in one in 500,000 people. So one in 167,000 people or one in 500,000 people are the two claims. The important thing to know about those two claims is both of those numbers are more rare than blood clots in the general population without taking a vaccine. So this seems to really be a whole lot of nothing. And it really comes down to uh, 
uh, these European governments who are trying to justify these terrible decisions they've made over uh, the past year where they did not stockpile a lot of vaccine. They did not roll it out well. All of the problems they said were going to hit Great Britain because of Brexit are hitting the European Union and proving the arguments of people like Daniel Hannan, who said over and over again, this is going to help Great Britain in these situations, not hurt it. Well, we're seeing that happen in real time here, and it's been uh, quite disturbing. Um, I don't know how you're going to get confidence back uh, in this uh, situation. And it's going to be interesting to watch with a bunch of these uh, you know, countries like the United States, who's going pretty fast on the vaccine train, um, Israel, uh, Great Britain, uh, the UAE is another one that's going uh, very quickly. When these countries get to those levels uh, where it's really knocking down cases, do we see flare ups in these other countries that aren't? That's going to be something really interesting to watch, and I'll be watching it along with you. We'll give you the updates as they come. Uh, another interesting development here, uh, an interesting piece from New York Magazine. Now, you know New York Magazine. They're very, there's two things they are, liberal and long-winded, okay? Every one of their stories is like nine million words, and they're almost always left-wing. This story, no exception to either one of those rules, but making some interesting observations about how difficult COVID has been to deal with uh, across all the entire political spectrum. There's this weird thing out there where the left seems to think, well, just listen, you know, put on your mask, put on your freak. How many times have I criticized this? Put on your effing mask. That is not a real message. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't do enough, at least, to make a real difference in this uh, situation. And, I, you know, governments around the world have figured this out very slowly, but they are figuring it out. This is from uh, New York Magazine. Uh, this is not to say that policy and behavior don't matter. Only that containing a novel disease we don't we understand incompletely is not as simple as hitting the science button. The mitigation measures on which the country has focused the most, masking, social distancing, school closures, restaurant restrictions, are curve benders, not firewalls. And many of the factors playing a much larger role in shaping the spread of the pandemic fit much less comfortably in a technocrat's shoulder bag or on a liberal's scolding moralism. I mean, this is the sort of stuff that is 100 percent true. But also something you never hear in the mainstream media. You don't hear this from CNN or you don't hear this uh, from so many on the left. Uh, it goes on. The CDC uh, aggregates and show. I mean, look at this is just to give you a quick setup on this. This is how difficult this is to this day to predict. They still, you know, they've been telling you science, science, science. And of course you listen to scientists. Of course you look at this stuff. But. This just shows how impossible this stuff is to predict at times for these scientists when it comes to specificity. Listen to this. The CDC aggregates and showcases 26 pedigreed models predicting the near-term course of the disease. On January 18th, only two of the 26 showed the dramatic case decline the country experienced by February 1st as being within what's called the 95% confidence interval. In other words, 24 of the 26 models said what ended up happening over the just the next two weeks was more or less statistically impossible. The other two gave it, at best, a sliver of a chance. That is how difficult this is. I mean, you know, they, they can keep telling you, just listen to the science. It's it's a lot harder than that. And I think if there was a bit of honesty in the media on the left from our politicians saying, you know what, maybe we don't know everything about this all the time. Maybe don't do, we can't just press the science button and everybody listens and everything goes well. And instead of just explaining to people like, look, there is a lot of uncertainty in this area and this area. Here's what we think you should do. Here's our advice. Take it or leave it, but this is what we believe is true. I think the American people could internalize that and say, okay, well, I'm going to go with this piece of it. This piece of it, I'm a little skeptical on. I'm going to go a different way. That's okay. That's okay. This is freaking America. Okay? This is how we deal with things. And I will say, you know, this is why I like the vaccine answer so much. This is how America deals with things. I don't know. Do we do things right all the time? Maybe, maybe not. But you know what? At the end of the day, we come up with the best crap at the end that knocks it all, uh, knocks it all out. We move on with our lives. That's America. Back in a second. You want to talk about America. You want to talk about Brooker's founding flavors, ice cream. Oh, this stuff is just it's just the best. Now, look, you can go to the grocery store and they have different levels of ice cream, right? You have kind of like the store brand, which is like, you know, I mean, I could still eat it. It's ice cream. And then you go up to the premium sorts of levels. You get the Ben and Jerry's or whatever. And it's good. It's it's it, I mean, I will say it's good. I like I like that stuff, even though I don't want to support communism. So I don't usually buy it. But, you know, it's pretty good. 
It's nothing compared to Brooker's Founding Flavors. This is a totally different level. It's, it's going to be a little more pricey. You're going to have to ship it to your house, so it's going to be a little pricier, but it's going to taste a million times better. Are you a quantity person or a quality person? This is high quality. Let me give you a couple of their flavors. Guns of Boston is freaking amazing. It has chunks of Little Debbie oatmeal cream pie in it. We had it at our house. Do we have it at our house? No, because we ate it all already. Then there's also uh, the St. Patrick's Day flavor. It's called a Shamrock something, Shamrock, Shamrock Smash, I think, or something. It's got Oreo cookies, um, and it's the mint Oreo cookies dipped in fudge. It's got chocolate chip brownies. It's got Andy's mints, all blended into an amazing scoop of ice cream. And it's something like, I don't know, 16% butterfat. Like the highest quality you're going to find at your grocery store is like maybe 12%. This is 16. It's over the top. It's going to blow your mind. you got to try it. Uh, you'll find these flavors a whole lot more. They have dozens of them, um, and they're all really incredible. At the Brooker's Founding Flavor Ice Cream website, go to brookersicecream.com. Click on the Ship Nationwide tab, brookersicecream.com. Just click on the Ship Nationwide tab. Get yourself some freaking delicious ice cream from brookersicecream.com. Thank you for hanging out till this point in the program. That means you're one of the cool kids. You're in the cool kids club. Please click like on this video. If you spend this much time watching it, you might as well. Also subscribe to the podcast, rate and review the podcast. All the things, they're always very much appreciated and helps us keep ahead of the algorithm robots uh, that are trying to eliminate this program at all times. I was back, actually watching a different program, uh, television program. Uh, it's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which I like to watch here and there. Mindless viewing. And it's so good. It's funny. And uh, it's very wrong, but also really funny. And I was watching, it was season eight, episode one. And it's on Hulu now. And I'm watching it. And at the bottom, when the episode ends, it says, up next, uh, you know, the next episode. It would say season eight, episode two, right? But it didn't say that. It said season eight, episode three. And I thought to myself, well, where is episode two? What happened to episode two? Went online, did a little searching for you. Okay. And what did I find? I went down a rabbit hole that ended in this article. Every blackface episode and scene that's been pulled from streaming so far. <laughs> so apparently this is, they, they say there's a, a blackface scene in season eight, episode two of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Now, of course, obviously they're not praising blackface. They're not using it to mock African-Americans. Um, what they're doing, you know, and, and there's actually been five episodes of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia that have been removed from streaming. And it's, you know, they're always making fun of, of the idiot characters on the show because they're dumb, right? The whole point of the show is these are bad people who do bad things and you should laugh at them because they're dumb and idiotic and stupid and wrong. That's the whole point of the show. So when they do things like in this particular episode, Dee dressed up as one of her comedy characters, Martina Martinez, uh, which apparently they counted as blackface. I don't, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how any of this works anymore. But she was basically being an idiot and she was being mocked. Two classic, well-known episodes of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, when they remake Lethal Weapon, and it, they do Lethal Weapon 5 and Lethal Weapon 6, someone has to play Danny Glover. So, you know, what road this goes down. But the point is, again, not to say that blackface is a good idea. It's to show you that really dumb people would think this is a good idea. Anyway, they took all of those out, and I started going through it. I mean, there's been episodes taken out from Community, Scrubs, The Office. There was a scene in The Office with blackface. 30 Rock, multiple episodes of 30 Rock have been taken out. A bunch of stuff uh, with Bob and David, which is a Netflix show, kind of the sequel to uh, Mr. Show, a great sketch comedy show from back in the day. But the most crazy one is they removed an episode of The Golden Girls. The freaking Golden Girls with Betty White, apparently there's an episode called Mixed Blessings where Betty White and Rue McClanahan introduce themselves to a black character while wearing mud masks that are mistaken for blackface. They weren't even doing blackface and they still got in trouble for blackface. There's the society you live in, everybody. Uh, go to Studio's merch. Pick up all the merch and stuff. There's a great, uh, it's uh, anyone else for governor. That shirt is up there. Perfect for the Gavin Newsom recall. We will see you tomorrow.